Well, hey, welcome back, everybody online. I'm so glad you're taking part of your day to join me talking about resetting your relationship. Resetting your relationship, Better Way Forward continues. This is the 13th week we've been in this series talking about and, and, and working toward a, a healthy 2023. And so if you're here for the very first time, my name is Dusty Otis, and I'm the lead pastor here at The Grove and the leader of Redefined Church, which is doing outreach uh, across the cities of our country. And so I'm thankful that you're here. And so we want to get just a little bit better today. That's why we gather. That's why you're online. You're going to go from being who you are to who God wants you to be. You got to do this. And so when you think about your personal relationship with God, you have to identify two things. Let's just jump right in. One, how often do you look to him? How often do you look to him? And when you look, how do you look? How do you look to him? And there's a couple, there's a couple three, there's a couple three, that's Oklahoma term. There's a couple three ways we do that. God rewards, Hebrews eleven six. 6, God re- rewards those who diligently seek him. So we're looking diligently. In Psalm 63, 1, it says, God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. So we look to him earnestly, diligently, earnestly. And then 1 Chronicles 6, 11 says, seek God's face always. So then we're looking always. We're looking earnestly and we're looking diligently. Why do we do that? Psalms 9:10 says, Those who know your name and trust in you, for you, Lord, you have never ever forsaken those who seek you. So God will not forsake you when you look to him. God will not forsake you when you look to him. Those who know you trust you because they have relationship. How do they have relationship? Because they look to you. So how often are we looking and, and then and then in what way do we look? And we look always earnestly and diligently, right? And to always earnestly, diligently seek means we should seek or look to him daily, daily. It's a daily walk, right? And so how do you look? We covered, um, we've covered a little bit of this in the past, but I want to jump to how we should be looking to him. There should be uh, an expectation when we come, when we come to God, right? So Matthew 6, says, seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you which means God's going to take care of you when you walk with him, when you seek him. I will look to the Lord. Micah 7, 7 says, I will look to the Lord and I will patiently wait for him. So this is how we're looking again. And then we're going to, Colossians 3, 23 says, set your mind and keep focus on things of heaven, not on things of the earth. That's Colossians 3, 2, by the way. 3, 2, I got a little anxious. 3, 23 is my favorite verse. And so, It's Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind and keep focus on the things of heaven, not on the things of earth. And then Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So we're looking first. We're going to look patiently. We're going to look focused. And we're going to look with assurance. Assurance is an expectation. Assurance is an expectation. And so, because in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, it's good. God is good. And so we're going there first, patiently focused and assured because God is good. Now, God's will is that your life on earth will be as is in heaven. That's why we pray Matthew 6, 10 through 15. That's the Lord's prayer. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it will be in heaven on earth as it will be in heaven. So when we look to God, it's with uh, devotion and attention to him. Because of who he is. He is the author and the founder. He's the perfecter. He's the finisher of our faith. Without him, there is no faith. Without engagement, without relationship, we have nothing, right? And so when we look, so when we look and how we look has a lot to do with success in our life. If you think about it for just a second, you can trace all of your successes to a relationship or to the relationships in your life. Why? Because it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's who you know. That's always how it is, right? That's always how it is. It's great to have a piece of paper. It's great to have experience. It's great to have X, Y, and Z. But bottom line is, who do I know? So the way that I like to get things done is pretty simple. I like to go relationship first. Who do I know that can help me, that I can work through, that I can work with? All right, what do I have? Resource, relationship, resource, and requisition. The sad thing is the world is coming to is, is being is being transformed into a requisition world. We just fill it out online and we wait. Well, that's not really proactive. And depending on who's on the other end of that email, text message, Instagram, uh, you know, <laughs> Instacart, whatever it is. 
depends on the timeliness of the response, right? So you want to go relationship, resource, requisition. It's about who you know, relationship first. And so really you have to ask yourself, am I investing wisely in the right relationships? Am I investing in the relationships that, um, that I need the most, that mean the most? Is there one relationship that you invest with God? Do you invest time with him? That's the one thing we're talking to our kids with on a daily basis right now. It's like, man, here's the thing. I love, I love what you're reading. I love the perspective God has given you, man. You really need to start learning and, and, and oh, being like Jesus. You want to learn who Jesus is. We need to get you to the gospels. Not for me, for you. Not for me, for you, right? So think about your most important relationships right now, whether that be your wife or your husband or your kids or your crazy uncle or your nephew or your best friend or the guy at the office or the girl at the office. Think about those. Did you gain depth and trust in those relationships on purpose or accidentally? Did you just show up one day at the office or at the house or in a marriage and be like, oh, this is a great relationship? No, no, the odds are you invested. You invested time, you probably invested some money, you invested, and because you invested, you have a relationship. Because, and the reality is if you invest and got nothing back, there's no relationship. Relationships are two-way streets. And so real relationships take time, otherwise they're just acquaintances. They're just people that we pass in the playground when we pick our kids up from school. Hey, good, good. See the game last night? Yeah, great, great. Yeah, too bad. Oh yeah, so sad. Sorry about that. Hey, see you next. See you tomorrow. That's what they become. Unless there's investment, unless there's time. Time has to be invested. It's the same way with God. We don't stumble into a great relationship with God. That's not possible. There has to be intention. There has to be purpose. There has to be diligence with that, right? We have to be devoted. That means to be intentional to prioritize our time with Him. We're going to be intentional. Now, the crazy thing is, is none of us view relationship building as a duty, right? Uh, something we have to keep up with, something we have to do. We don't view building relationships like that because we love it, right? But for some reason, over time, today, we think building a relationship with God is like work. Oh, I have to do. Your, your relationship with God is never a have to. It's a get to. There's opportunity in it, and there's life in it, and there's better in it when you invest in the relationship right? Not just come to him in crisis mode, but come to him in everyday mode, right? And so we don't view relationship building as a duty to kid with because we love it. You love it so much that you find time to be around the people that you want to be around with. Period. And so it's so very important that we do that. Why? Because we love it, but because it also feeds us back. The relationships that we love are those that pour back into us. And so if we looked at relationship building as something we had to do, then most of the people we're close with probably wouldn't be close to us because they would sense that, oh, you're just doing this because you feel like you have to. I was talking to a buddy earlier this week. He said, man, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. That's what it's like. Oh, you're just being my friend because you see that I need a friend right now, not because you want to be my friend, right? And so the people who are close to you are only close to you because they've been through the process. They've been through the grind. They've been through the ups and downs, the hills, the valleys, the ins and the outs right? The highs and the lows with you. They've been part of that process because they've invested. Those are great relationships. So then investing in a real relationship requires a couple things. Love, trust, and devotion. It's consistency. I'm going to come back. It's not transactional. Those transactional relationships that we have never tend to go very far. We know, okay, I only call him when I need this, okay? He doesn't call me unless he needs something. I don't call him unless he needs something. And for some of us, that's a lot how our family works. We don't talk to our family members unless they need something. And when the phone rings from somebody that we know that is only transactional, we know, oh crap, he's calling. He must need something. They must, well, he don't call me otherwise. He must need something. It's not transactional. It's going to be hard to find friends or make friends or have a friend in God if you only think about them or only go to them when you need something. Same way with God, right? Same is true in our relationship with God. It won't happen on its own. It's not going to, we don't go to God only in crisis mode. It's a two way street. That relationship is two way. That's why spiritual disciplines are so very important. They're so important. And so reality is that we don't always feel like reading our Bible. We don't always feel like praying. We don't always feel like worshiping. We don't always feel like journaling. We don't always feel like sitting and reflecting it's because you, it's your human nature. You're a soulful person, right? We're talking about being three parts whole. You don't always feel like that. You know, I started this, um, 
I started this with three minutes a day. It was the hardest thing I, I did, but I didn't feel like it. Our discipline, our discipline leads to transformed desire. Your discipline leads to a transformed desire. You get started to stay started. It's God's responsibility. It's a two-way street. You get started to stay started. You know, there's a quote that I love. It says, motivation will get you started. Habit will keep you going. You want to develop healthy habits. Because behind that healthy habit is the motivation that will get you there. Behind that motivation is a memory. If you know God, if God saved your life, if you believe in Jesus and you call him Savior, the thing that he did for you that day, you never forget. You never forget. We just celebrated Kaz's 10-year-old birthday. He just turned 10 this, this past week. And it's a big deal for us to celebrate 10. 10's a big deal because I feel like, well, you're only, you're only single digits nine years, and, and most of those you don't remember anyways, right? And so first part of your life, you're one through nine, single digit, and you're very fortunate if you make it to the triple digit. So most of your life, you're going to be lived in double digits. So we make 10-year-olds like... That's the birthday. This is the birthday we never want our kids to forget because they know, hey, one, we stepped into really the phase of life we're going to be in or the number that we're going to be in for a while. And so all that said, there's a memory that they're making on that 10-year birthday. Oscar did it. Kaz has done it. Laney will be there in just about a year and a half. And so as we look to that, that's great. But there's a memory of who God is. There's a memory of that day for them. And the memory of our salvation, the day that we found God, right, we remember what he did for us, the price that was paid for us. We remember the prayer that we prayed or the moment that we set in or the walk that we took down the aisle, right? And that memory tends to be what motivates you to dig in, to come back to God on a regular basis. It fuels our personal devotion. It's why we look to him every day and it's why we look with an, with an expectation, earnestly, diligently, every day, right? Right? He wants the entire human race to experience that moment. That moment, the moment that you came to Christ. If you have not done that yet, we're going we're gonna to handle that here in just a second. But he wants the entire human race to experience that moment because, because most of us can't remember that moment. Now, for, for a lot of us, it's been a long time since that moment. But that, that moment is our memory. That memory is our motivation. If you've not experienced that moment, I just want to give you one second to do this really quickly. You can just simply repeat after me. I'm going to pray a prayer called the prayer of salvation or the believer's prayer. It simply goes like this. If you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you want to cross the line from, from hell to heaven. You want to begin a new walk. Just repeat after me. Father God, I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross to take my sin. I believe he died, that he beat death, that he rose again. Thank you. Thank you for saving my life. Jesus, help me follow you. To your name I pray. Amen. Now what you prayed is just found in Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again, you will be saved. And so then you are saved if you prayed that prayer and you meant it. Now, here are the action steps that follow. We see in the re what we see is the result of Jesus' devotion and discipline during the temptation that he walked through when he fasted and prayed for 40 days. This is in Matthew chapter 4. And after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, which is real discipline, by the way, you got to be solid. We once had a, uh, one of our worship leaders decide that, that, sh that she was going to fast for 40 days. And about 13 days in, she was white and she looked terrible. I was like, hey, you're not Jesus. Okay, you should probably eat something because gum's not doing it anymore. You should, th the way that you appear looks like you're just like barely alive. And, uh, and, and you're important to our team, so I need you to eat, right? And so then that's real discipline. The devil, in this, in this season of, of Jesus' life, he comes and he tempts him with any and everything that he can. He tries three different ways, and each time Jesus overcomes those temptations with the power of Scripture, it's what he had in his heart. It's the truth of what God says about us. It's the promises that God has, has laid out before us to live in. And because of that relationship... His father, right, God, he overcame. Why? Because it was in his heart. It was in his heart. There was a relationship. Jesus knew that to withstand the enemy, he needed, he needed a great heart knowledge. Not just a, a belief or, or a knowledge in my head of like, well, I, I, know that, I know what Isaiah 53, 5 says. I already know that. It's not about head knowledge. He knew he needed to go to his heart. What he knew 
that he knew, that he knew in his heart, his heart belief, right? He knew what his father was about. He knew what his, what his father's business was. And he knew that he was here on assignment, right? And by investing regular time, Jesus often went away to pray and to be with God. So he invested regular time in learning and, and he applied what he learned and what God gave him to do. So then when the time of testing came, he overcome every obstacle. He overcame every trial with truth, not theory, not agenda, not right, not left, with truth, with truth, not theory. And so how regularly are you investing in your relationship with God is the big question. If you're taking notes, you can write that. How regularly do I invest in my relationship with God? Do I do this to say I did? Do I do this because I know I have to or that, that I know I should? Or do I do this for the, for the sure will and the enjoyment of being with God? Because, man, this is the best part of my day. How regularly do you do that? How often are you intentionally learning truth and storing truth in your heart so you can overcome the battles of life? Because that comes from your relationship with God. Do you recognize that you need to create a healthy habit of engaging with God every single day? Have you recognized that yet? Do you need to focus on spending more time in prayer? Do you want to connect with God through worship, through gratitude, spending time with Him outside somewhere? Here's the reality. We never ever accidentally stumble into any relationship, especially the relationship with our Creator, with God. And what God put on my heart today was to look at the devotion of David, okay? And in Acts 13, God says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, conforming to my will and purposes, who will do all of my will. If you know anything about David, he wasn't the best example. David was kind of a dirtbag. He committed adultery. He was a murderer. And, and those are just two of many other things he did. But God still saw good in him. Even though he did not do good, he still saw, God still saw good in him. Why is he considered a man after God's heart? He submitted to God's will. He was obedient and he lived solely for God. That was his deal. And so we should all aspire to be called the same by God. That, that Dusty is a man after God's own heart. That Heather is a woman after God's own heart. That Philip, John, our people, our men, that Sarah and Rachel, our ladies, our women after God's own heart, that we would be called that. We should all aspire to that. Let's look deeper at David's daily devotional, what it looked like, and what we can take from him to become better ourselves so we can have a deeper devotion with God. If we pay attention to Scripture, David describes his heart and devotion in his own writings. And so I'm going to hit these fairly quickly this morning, but we should adopt these principles. You should adopt these principles in your devotion with God. Here's the first thing that he was. He was humble. David was humble. It says Psalms 62.9, Lowborn men are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. David warns us in this moment right here in Psalm 62.9, do not put your trust in men. The multitude, those of low degree, uh, are changeable just as the wind are, right? The rich and the noble seem to have much in their power and lavish promises, but those that depend on them are disappointed. Weighed in the balance of scriptures, this is Psalm 69, weighed in the balance of scripture, all that man can do to make us happy is vanity. It's simply vanity. Even David, being King David, did not think too highly of himself. He was humble. God is the one who brings promotion anyways. God is the only one who brings promotion. The second thing David was, he was reverent. He was reverent. So Psalms 18, 3, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am saved from my enemies. He understands right now. I go to God first, seek first, keep God and all these things will be added to me. He was reverent. God is the ultimate. So then it is a privilege to meet with the maker of heaven and earth every day. It's not a have to. It's a get to. It's a privilege. The third thing that David was, was he was respectful. He was respectful. This is Psalms 31.9. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body 
with grief. Regardless of position, we should always know our place. Come into your time with God with respect. We want to reset this relationship today. It's going to start with these things. The fourth thing he was was trusting. David was trusting. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronger of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God's got this. This is Psalms 27. Psalms 27 verse 1. Nothing beats a man who trusts God with his life. I tell you, there's some stuff right now in my life that looks pretty bleak, but I'm still standing right here. God, you didn't, you didn't bring us this far. You didn't bring me this far to say, okay, you didn't. I trust you. I trust you. The fifth thing David was is he was loving. I love you. Oh, Lord, my strength. I love you. Psalms 18. Numerous times Davis lets us know where his heart is and that his heart is for God. This is why he was a man after God's own heart. He knew the relationship that he had with God was the number one priority in his life, especially if he was going to be king, right? If you do everything and you do it perfect, but you do not have love, you've done nothing. You've done nothing. Your time with God is solely about your love for him, not what you can do for him or what he can do for you. It's good to tell God, I love you. Wake up in the morning. Good morning, Lord. Man, I love you today. I'm thankful for this day. You've woken me up, Lord. That my feet hit the floor, that I have an able body, that my ligaments, tendons, joints, everything works properly. Lord, thank you for my health today. Thank you for being so good to me. I love you, Lord. It's good to say that. Sixth thing, he was devoted. David was devoted. You filled my heart with greater joy than when the than when their grain and new wine abound. Psalms 4, 7. He was devoted. Regardless of how good I have it or how much I have of it, my heart is still yours, God. I am devoted to you. Seventh thing, he honored. He honored God. He says, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell of all your wonders. No one is greater than you, God. He's saying no one is greater than you, God. The eighth thing, he was faithful. He was faithful Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 23, 6. What is this? Steady. Surely the goodness of the Lord will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Steady, consistent, diligent, committed, faithful. I know and I believe that the best place for me is with the Lord. I'm going to be here every day of my life. This is where I want to be. It's faithful. He was obedient. We are wrapping this thing up. He was obedient. Here's what he asked in Psalms 119.34. Give me understanding and I will keep your law and I will obey it with all of my heart. What, what's David saying here? I'm going to be a learner. I'm going to seek understanding. I'm going to gain belief in my heart. I'm going to seek wisdom. I'm going to seek God daily. I'm going to invest my time with him and I'm going to build great Christ-like character. Why? Because I'm obedient. And the final thing, he was repentant. He was repentant. He came in and said, I'm sorry, and asked forgiveness. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity through it, though it is great. Sorry. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. That's Psalms 25, 11. One, admit when you're wrong. Say, I'm sorry. Let your actions match your words. Let all repentance be led with your heart, not your head. Oh, man, I feel bad. I should say, I'm sorry. No, that's soulish. We want to come from our spirit. We want refreshment in our heart. Only God can do that. That happens when we come with our whole heart repentantly, right? David was a man after God's own heart because he demonstrated his faith and he was committed to following the Lord. He was committed. He's a great example for how we are to be devoted and how we are to have the heart and the character of God. I'm going to close with this. When it comes to resetting your relationship with God, there's one last thing you need to know. It's an old Christian song. But this, God calls you friend. God calls you friend. This is John 15, verses 14 through 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You are my friends if you do what I command, if you are obedient, if you do what I command. The most important and valuable relationship you can have in your life is with Jesus. 
It's the one who helps you walk right. He restores you to the Father. You get to be called righteous. Everything in your life should start with Jesus because he said, I'm already in it. I'm already, I'm already all in. Like, I'm already calling you, friend. I just need you to, to come back on the friendship. I'm already calling you, friend. Henry Ford said, your best friend is the one who brings out the best within you. You know who brings out the best within you? There's only one person, Jesus. Only one person knows you, knows what's in you, and knows how to bring it out of you. That's Jesus. And we all want people around us that, that make us better, who are not content to stay the same. Jesus, Jesus is the most consistent, and he wants better for you every single day. And here's the reality, on earth, when you get better, I get better. When I get better, you get better. When you get better, we get better. That's how iron sharpens iron. Scripture tells us that he is closer than a brother. He is closer than a brother. A brother comes along in times of trial, in times of triumph. As iron sharpens iron, a brother makes you better. Jesus comes along and makes you better. You know why Kaz is good? Kaz is, is our second born. Oscar's going to be 12 here next month. And Kaz is 10. Kaz is taller and bigger. He's more physical. He's more competitive. Why? Because he has a brother. Because he has a brother. That brother's pushed him. He's played keep up, and he's played up in every sport to play with his brother. So therefore, he's better. Why? He had a brother to walk with him. He had a brother to walk with him. And so this happens when you invest in your relationship with him. If you're gonna reset your relationship with God, you need to see you're a friend, he's closer than a brother, he wants to walk with you, okay? So when you do that, you recognize that he's going to move on your behalf. And the more that you invest in that relationship, the more you take time to be with him, the more he's going to be with you, the more that you'll notice he is with you every single day. As a Christian or believer, knowing our why is probably the biggest part of the battle, right? It's, it's, it's if we're disconnected, if we're inconsistent, we kind of lose that. And it's like, oh, 87% of the people on the face here don't know why they're even here, right? And so it's easy to lose our why and just become like everybody else. But we're here on earth first for relationship with God. He put us here to help more people get in relationship with him. That's why it's go into all the world and make disciples. Go into all the world and, and tell them about me so we can all have relationship and fellowship and community together so when we get to heaven, it can be a party, right? That's what it's about. Here's the thought I wanna leave you with. What's the one spiritual discipline, the one healthy habit, the one healthy spiritual habit you can begin right now to grow in your relationship with God? What's that one thing? Good. 1A, how will it improve your relationship with Him? How can you see this one thing that you identify improving your relationship with Him? Here's your action step. Get started on that. Get started on that. Spend intentional time this week praying about the one way that you can develop spiritual discipline so that you can get to know God in a deeper way and grow in your relationship with Him. That could be a number of different things from going from a five second prayer to a 15 second to a 30, 45, two minutes. That can be not just reading a verse of the day, but reading a chapter a day or a segment a day because the Bible is not like regular books. There are parts. That could be worshiping. A lot of people I know worship in their cars. That's great. What if you did? What if you weren't in your car? What if you had to pay attention to traffic and billboards and, and all the awesome people driving around you? and you actually worship with open hands and open heart, and you actually open your hands, not just to give worship, but to receive good from God. Worship, it can be journaling, it can be sitting in silence. I sit in silence every day. You can just be sitting and listening. When's the last time you sat and listened to God? Could be journaling, should be, could be writing down, answering questions. Could be writing down what you read, what God said to you through what you read, right? Could be reflection, could be so many things. What's one thing you can do? Take time to pray about that this week and reset your relationship with God. 
We have one month, it's the start of December. Let's be grounded and rooted in a routine of engagement with God this year, right? Finish this year strong. So in 2023, it's not gonna be automatic because of daily engagement, but you have it set so you can move forward uh, with a better trajectory than you did this year or years past. Father, thanks so much for the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, for the will that you have for each person's life that can hear my voice right now, Lord. Grateful for all of those who are online and podcasting with us. Thank you, Lord, for the time they're investing. Lord, I just ask you would sow back into them or that they would see fruit and they would reap a harvest from the time that they're sowing into becoming better, resetting their relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for showing up on their behalf. Thank you for your presence in their lives. Thank you for blessing people today. I love you and I'm grateful, Lord, for the opportunity. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. If today's message spoke to you, ask the same thing to you every week. Send it on. Somebody needs to hear it. Let them know about it. Our giving campaign, we are building budgets and, and trying to get outreach stuff squared away for next year. Please take time to click the link in the bio to give and help us. Uh, that's all I got. Next week, we're going to continue in a better way forward talking about other relationships. So we reset our relationship with God this weekend. We're going to talk about resetting those other relationships in our lives. Do not miss that now. I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation this week in the knowledge of Him. I pray the perception of your mind would be enlightened and that you would know what His hope, His calling, and His purpose are for you and the great things that He has in store for you as we approach the end of the year. I'm so thankful that you were here. Thanks for taking time. Thank you for partnering with us financially, for, for serving and giving to the ministry. I'm grateful for you. Hope you have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.